Hello, my name's Dr James Gill and welcome back to my kitchen for yet another deep dive on the neurological examination. The moment we're approaching toward the end of lockdown, we're finally being told that we may be able to get out in the wide world again. And crucially, I might be able to get this mop cut. So, with that in mind, we've had the neurological demonstration done, and today we're going to touch on the features of that examination and what it is that we're looking for. However, I want to highlight, A, not only is the neurological examination, in my opinion, one of the hardest things to understand the theory before, also wasn't my strongest bit at medical school, so you're going to have to bear with me a bit if we go with some slightly rudimentary approaches to the science. It's how I've remembered it at the end of the day, and there were waves that stuck in my head as mnemonics and things like that. Okay. So, to start off, when it comes to a neurological examination, essentially what you're trying to do is determine does the patient have an upper motor neuron lesion or do they have a lower motor neuron lesion? And right from the get-go, you can see part of the issue with the neurological examination and neurology generally. It has its own vocabulary that is somehow some degree separate from the other vocabulary that we'll see in general medicine. So as we go through this, I'm going to try and flesh out some of that vocabulary so that we all know what we're talking about. And I think defining an upper and a motor neuron lesion is probably the best thing to do to start off with. As you can see from the slightly variable light in here, it's a gloriously sunny day outside. A little bit bluster in the hundred acre woods, as they say. So uh, you may have to deal with a few ups and downs in terms of light changes through here. So, that brief technical aside, the upper motor neuron lesion. So this is any injury occurring above the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord and above uh, the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves. So what does that mean in real terms? Basically, it's any problem from the spine upwards, apart from the exclusion of the cranial nerves there, because they're just a pain in the neck. With that, obviously, the lower motor neuron is going to be the same, but inversed. So here is any injury that's occurring to the nerves below the anterior horn cell of the spinal cord or below the motor nuclei of the cranial nerves. So a good way of perhaps looking at between the two is the lower motor neuron is essentially affecting the, the hardware of the limb, whereas the upper motor neuron lesion, it's somehow affecting the control of the muscle groups as opposed to the hardware. Hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense in a moment or two. Um, in terms of trying to ease that in, um, an upper motor neuron lesion is commonly seen in strokes, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, ALS, and you know, just simple brain injuries. Well, they're not very simple a brain injury, but the point is injuries to the brain are going to cause that upper motor neuron lesion. By comparison, saying that it's got to be the spine and below, we know that lower motor neuron lesions are going to be spinal muscular atrophy, post-polio syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, myasthenia gravis, or even uh, neuropathies such as carpal tunnel or diabetic neuropathy. I think the diabetic is a really interesting point there because we think of diabetes as know, a cardiovascular issue, an endocrine issue, but a large number of the consequences that uh, come with diabetes are actually related to neurological. So on upper motor neuron lesion, we get damage to the eyes and the peripheral nervous system as well, so lower motor neuron lesions, and they can have catastrophic effects on the patient, which we'll talk about when we touch on the examination. So as a simple overview, we need to appreciate that for the neurological examination we're going to have a look at appearance, tone, power, reflexes, sensation and coordination. 
And for all of those, we're going to see different characteristics in both the upper and the lower motor neuron lesion. But before we go specifically on to the examination, just want to do a deep, uh, small detour into cranial nerves. Now, as mentioned, our upper and lower motor neuron lesions are from the um, anterior horn cell and below, or from the nuclei upwards in cranial nerves, because cranial nerves do their own thing. And a really good example, which also shows the difference between an upper and lower motor neuron lesion, is cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. So in terms of uh, the facial nerve lesions, these can both be upper and lower motor neuron lesion. So here's a good cutaway of the skull showing the brain, the origins of uh, the facial nerve, and also the pathways on the face. So what we can see here is that the cranial nerve has two innovations. It's bilaterally innervated. So both the left and the right side of the brain supply both sides of the face. And on the image here, if we look at the orange first, so we follow down from the patient's left, that goes to the right side of the patient's face. And there is a crossover, meaning that the half of that nerve is also going to go to the left side of the patient's face for the upper region there. So here's a good overview of the facial nerve. We can see we've got both sides of the brain providing to both sides of the face and crossing over. That crossover means we get bilateral innovation. So we've got innovation from both sides of the brain going to both sides of the face. So let's start off with the right side of the face. We can follow the orange line up from the bottom side, but the top side has both orange and yellow because at that crossover, we're getting some fibers coming from the opposite side of the head as well. So if we get a, a stroke, if we have um, loss of the left side of the brain there with a, uh, an upper motor neuron lesion, we're going to lose all of the input from that side of the brain, but we're not going to get complete loss of that side of the face. Again, if we stay with the diagram here, we've lost the orange side, so that's going to mean that we lose the right side lower region of the face. But because we can see the dotted nerve above it for the upper region, that's getting bilateral innervation. So that innervation is also supplied by the same side of the face. So what this bilateral innervation means is it's only the lower side of the face on an upper motor neuron lesion here that is lost. That bilateral innervation allows sparing of the forehead. So for this patient, they will be unable to smile, but they'll still be able to close their eyes, raise their eyebrows up and wrinkle the forehead. Now, if we follow those tracks down and now give a lower motor neuron lesion, so where the nerves have exited the skull going to the face, both nerves from the left and the right are going to be affected. As a result, we're going to lose the lower half of the face again, but this time we're also going to lose the upper half of the face. We often see patients coming into the A&E department who've lost one side of their face in terms of movement or control, and they're terrified they've had a stroke. And it's actually really positive to be able to reassure that as long as the whole of the face is affected, this is most likely a lower motor neuron lesion due to Bell's palsy. So we don't need to worry about them having had a stroke and hopefully their um, symptoms will resolve completely. Unfortunately, um, I had a lady a few years ago that came to the A&E department and she was a nurse and she thought she'd have Bell's palsy that morning and thus hadn't worried to come into the A&E department straight away. And I was seeing her quite late in that evening. 
And unfortunately, I was willing her during the examination to not be able to move the side of her face as she was talking to me because I could see that she was still expressing with the upper region of her face. And I was absolutely heartbroken when I formally assessed her, asked her to raise her eyebrows up, she was able to. Because the forehead, because the facial nerve has bilateral innervation, with a stroke, with an upper motor neuron lesion, you get forehead sparing. Her forehead was spared, she was still able to control her eyebrows, and thus unfortunately, we knew that she'd had a stroke but she delayed because she'd assumed it was Bell's palsy. And that's something that we really need to highlight, that the NHS has a big campaign about dealing with a stroke. Do you have any fast symptoms? Is there any facial weakness? Is there any arm weakness? Any slurring of your speech? In which case time is important. Ring 999. Even if it's a Bell's palsy, I'm more, you know, we want to see you straight away. This is one of those emergency things that we need to be able to differentiate for you. And we're not really going to be able to do that over the phone or online. We need to get to see you face to face. If we do have Bell's palsy, so the whole face is affected, uh, this lady very kindly allowed us to use a picture of herself when she had Bell's palsy. You can see that she can't wrinkle her forehead. She can't lift her eyebrow up. She's lost the nasal labial folds and she's unable to smile. Thankfully, as you can see, she has gone on to make a complete recovery, um, as is quite common with lower motor neuron lesions on the facial nerve here. So, with that in mind, let's go back to our straightforward examination. Our appearance, tone, power, reflexes, sensation and coordination. We're going to start off with our end of bed inspection, as we do in every examination. We want to have a look at the patient. So in terms of this appearance, what, what are we looking for? Well, obviously for an upper limb, we want to make sure, as Abby has done for us, that her arms are bare so that we can check for symmetry, both proximally in the muscles close to the body and distally those away from it. And we want to pay attention for any deformities, muscle wasting, any muscle hypertrophy, because having big muscles more than we'd expect is still an abnormal variation, any fasciculations or involuntary movements. So when we say that, what sort of things are we thinking about? Well, deformities. So if we've got an upper motor neuron lesion, as mentioned, we get increased tone and we're going to have reduction in movement likely there. That over time might result in disuse atrophy, so it might cause muscle wasting. We may find a paralysis where the patient is unable to move. We may see that in cerebral palsy as an example, that affecting perhaps one side of the body. We may see muscle wasting, which we get early on with a lower motor neuron lesion, but in more advanced in the upper motor neuron lesion. We may get that fasciculation, so the muscle twitching under the skin. Crucially, with a fasciculation, we can see parts of a muscle moving, but not the whole muscle. And we've all had fasciculations like that, I'm almost certain. The classic example is the twitching of the eyelid when we're particularly tired or we've not been looking after ourselves. That's a fasciculation. The whole muscle isn't moving, which is why we're not blinking, but we're just getting some muscle fibers moving, which is why you can see that small twitch if you're looking at it in the mirror. But whenever you put your finger to it, you can't actually feel it moving. So with regard to muscle bulk, don't forget that the lower motor neuron lesion is going to cause wasting because we've cut the control to that muscle. The muscle can no longer fire, so can't maintain itself, and thus we'll get loss over time. We'll get that same loss over time with an upper motor neuron lesion, but that's much slower. One of the things that we may see um, is we may see a tremor. And there's lots of information we need to get about a tremor because that can help us with the diagnosis. A big thing is going to be how quick is that tremor? Is it a fast tremor or is it a slow tremor? What's the amplitude? Is it very fine, such as we might see 
Well, what, what, what can you think of at home that's likely to cause um, issues with a tremor? Anything that you might use? You know, perhaps, you know, we've had the fasciculation to your eye, you're feeling very tired, you go reach something from the, uh, the cupboard to try and help, and that actually results in a fine tremor itself if you've had too many cups of it. Yes, coffee, caffeine, that can cause a fine tremor, as, as we've seen from um, the uh, uh, thyroid examination, where we're placing a piece of paper on the hands to try and identify a tremor, hyperthyroidism will cause a fine tremor as well. We also want to know, is that tremor actually quite coarse, you know, very visible? And one example we may see that is the asterixis, where we've got a cerebellar issue uh, from alcoholic encephalopathy. Also, is that tremor when the patient is at rest, or does it occur on movement, for example, an intention tremor? Perhaps before we go further on that, let's just confirm what a tremor is. So a tremor is a repetitive oscillating movement about a joint. So the most common pathological tremor is actually an, is what's called an essential tremor. This can be symmetrical, so it could be both sides, and it is on activity, which is why it could be really, really problematic for patients. One of the treatments, one well, tests that we can do more than a treatment for an essential tremor is trial a small amount of alcohol. That often reduces the symptoms from an essential tremor, confirms our diagnosis, and means that we can use more effective treatments such as beta blockers to try and reduce that. With Parkinson's disease, one of the classical causes of a tremor, we get a resting tremor. It's quite coarse and it's what's termed a pill rolling tremor. So the patient will roll their fingers back and forth, back and forth. This will initially be an asymmetrical tremor, so it'll occur on one side before eventually, over time, becoming bilateral. And it's a three to six hertz tremor. It's actually quite quickly. And if you have a look at some of the famous people who've identified that they have Parkinson's, that being uh, Michael J. Fox in the Back to the Future series, we'll talk about him in a little bit more in a moment, Billy Connolly and Alan Alder of MASH, we can see that coarse, you know, quite fast tremor in their hands in some interviews and things. Now, we mentioned that um, we can get an asterixis in um, hepatic encephalopathy. So there we're going to be worried about problems with the cerebellum. And we can get a range of symptoms that occur there. And they have a particularly tasty mnemonic that I like, Danish. What that means is if there's a problem with the cerebellum, then we get a series of set um, symptoms. We get something called an inability to perform dysdocodyskinesis, so their coordination goes, so they can't do repetitive, simple movements. They will get ataxia, so they have difficulty walking, and may end up with the asterixis as well. They'll have problems with nystagmus, so their eyes are beating strangely. They'll have an intention tremor. They'll also have slurring of speech, and probably reduction hypotonia, so the loss of tone in their limbs. Can you think of anything? So we've talked about caffeine for fine tremors. Can you think of anything that also might be kept in your cupboard or that you may be buying out, out of the wider world for that would cause these stainish type symptoms that could affect the cerebellum? Yes, alcohol. Think about that if you've ever been drunk, so your coordination goes, you can't walk quite correctly, you get an intention tremor, you know, you can't quite get, uh, pick up what you're wanting to, you're definitely slurring of the speech, and if you've really drunk a lot, they tend to go a bit limp and floppy as you just have had enough, really. So Danish is, um, and that cerebellar signs are a good example of a collection of tremors and neurological issues there. So I'm, I mentioned um, uh, Michael J. Fox in um, an example of Parkinson's. Now he's been a huge proponent of Parkinson's and as a result of that we've got lots of footage of him ex exhibiting different movements and 
problems with his Parkinson's, and I think that's worthwhile looking at at the moment. So here he's had um, an interview with Oprah. I'm just going to let that run for a second. This is one fact of my life, but it's not the totality of my life. It doesn't define me. I like that you call, I like, uh, yeah. I like that you call the book Always Looking Up and why you did that, because... It's a bit of a short joke. It's a short joke. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can say this, but, but, but my world growing up was mostly asses and elbows. <laughs> and, and, um, and in the same way, too, the second part of the Adventures of an Incurable Optimist is also yes. a, a, a pun on, be, on, on being incurable. Incurable. You know, I remember when I first was diagnosed, and, and I, the next day I got into bed. I said, oh, I get into bed, I'm sick. And then after about two hours, I was like, well, this is stupid. <laughs> I'm no different than I was yesterday. Now, if we look at some of the involuntary movements that he's making, they actually have a technical name, dyskinesis, involuntary movements. And there's a huge you know, raft of um, what these are. But they're not actually due to Parkinson's themselves here. Like alcohol causing our cerebellar signs, these dyskinesias, in the case of Parkinson's, are actually due to the medications that are being taken that allow him to have more control over his body, but will have to pay with these as side effects. So in terms of dyskinesias, we can get dystonias, sustained muscle contractions, um, and they can sort of give him abnormal twisting movements or postures that he holds. Careers, fast, jerky, involuntary, unpredictable movements. And that's slightly different from myoclonus, where he'll have shock-like repetitive muscle spasms that will come and go. We've all probably had experiences with muscle spasms, um, and they're frequently seen in, the, in what's called hypnagogic movements, when people are falling asleep. So you're going to sleep and you'll, 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 you know, you've seen your, your partner you know, as they're lying next to you, perhaps twitching ever so slightly as they're dropping off. Essentially, that's because the body has fallen asleep slightly faster than the brain has, and the brain's sending a quick jolt out to say, hey, are you still there? And giving that myoclonic movement. We certainly don't worry about that in most cases. We'll come to that in a minute. The other issue that we see with uh, Michael J. Fox and these side effects is this slow writhing movements that occasionally he was putting up with. These are, this is an atherosclerosis. Okay. And ultimately, it's about identifying these issues so that we can help people. And hopefully with that, you can see that we've already got a lot of information just from assessing visually the patient before we've actually gone on to do anything for them at all. There is going to be an overlap here with what we can see and what we're going to feel when we assess the patient for tone. Having had a look over the patient and made sure that everything is symmetrical, there's no abnormal movements and things, then we need to be able to look at the patient's tone. So what is tone? Tone is the feeling of resistance when you're moving the joint passively. So I'm moving the joint rather than the patient doing it for me. And in order to assess tone, for me to be able to check it, the patient has to completely relax, go loose and floppy to let me move that joint. That can be quite difficult for patients. So if we are finding that they're not able to relax their arm properly, get them to close their eyes potentially and count backwards from 20 or spell a word backwards. It is important that they relax because I need to move all of the joints through a full range of movement to assess if there's any difficulty or resistance in doing that movement. Now, we're going to do some um, simple movements to start off with. Um, let me do the movements to start off with. So just go loose and floppy for me. Okay, so I'm just going to rotate your arm, and then round. And let me change over. Any problems with that? Mm -hmm. So you're going to do the same again, just let me turn your hand round and round and round and then up and down. 
Okay, that was good. The tone for a lower motor neuron will be normal or decreased, whereas we're going to see an increased tone of rigidity to the muscles in an upper motor neuron lesion. And you're going to see here that we may get some abnormal movements with regards to this, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. With regard to tone, upper motor neuron lesions can be tricksy little things. We do get increased tone with an upper motor neuron lesion, and we'll also get increased reflexes with an upper motor neuron, but those will not be there initially. So, for example, when a patient's coming with a stroke, they'll initially have hypotonia on the affected limb, and they'll also have reduced reflexes on the affected limb. Over time, that will then develop to the increased tonal rigidity and the very brisk upper limb reflexes. So, with a lower motor neuron lesion, we're going to get a reduction in tone. They're going to be quite floppy because we've cut all um, neurological control to that muscle. Conversely, with an upper motor neuron lesion, we're going to have increased tone to that muscles, to that movement group, hence why we want to make sure the movements are round joints and in specific ways rather than just individual movements. We think that we get increased tone with an upper motor neuron lesion because there's the loss of regulation inhibition from the brain saying, yeah, you're not doing anything. Don't tax yourself, don't get these muscles contracted because you're not doing anything at the moment. And this increased tone has a terminology, that being spasticity. But this is a very specific word. Okay. Spasticity means increased resistance or increased tone when the joint is moved at speed. So that increased tone is proportional to the amount of speed that's put in. So if you try to move the arm gently, you probably will be able to. But if you were to try and move it rapidly, you come across what's called a clasp knife response that it captures and then will open up afterwards. There's another increased tone that we can see, rigidity, also described as a lead pipe phenomenon, where the arm or whatever uh, muscle group or limb is difficult to move throughout the range of movement. And it's like trying to bend a lead pipe. You can do it, but it's difficult to do. And this is always with the patient attempting to be in the relaxed position. So just to recap, with the examination here, we've done regular movements, all of the joints are going round and round and round. And one of the other things that we're going to be checking for, as mentioned with Michael J. Fox there, is clonus. So whether or not that's that the muscle catches and then beats after it has been stretched. If you, most people have actually experienced this. If they've gone to the gym, they've been doing a lot of work, you press and then relax, you can get a few beats, this clonus of the muscle after it's been stretched quite so. Six beats is abs and, and under is completely normal. But if we, get, if we stretch the muscle, and then we check for clonus, and we're getting continued uh, beating here, then this is going to suggest that there may be something underlying. So if we stretch the muscle quickly, and then we get more than six beats to the muscle, then we're going to be worried that there might be something underlying this. This is an upper motor neuron lesion, but is more often seen in the lower legs rather than in the upper limbs. Another thing that we'll need to check for um, once we've done these movements, and it blends a little bit towards power, is get the patient to make a fist, squeezing our fingers tight as we can. That allows us to assess for power, yes. But when they relax, it also allows us to check another facet of tone, that being myotonia, the difficulty in relaxing of muscles, which when they release, if there was a problem, they wouldn't be able to do.